chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my, but my, by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, and, and I and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some, of you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Ray, for the Bible reading. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to church once again. It's great to see everyone here, um, particularly if it's your first time here or if you're visiting us. Uh, a really warm welcome. We really hope you enjoy the service um, and you get a lot out of today's service. Uh, Please keep your Bibles open. Uh, We will be staying in the chapters uh, that we read out uh, this time, just for a change. Uh, But do keep it open because we'll be uh, following through the text. Now, if you were following Jesus around 2,000 years ago, up until the events that we read up today, so just imagine that you were there, actually on the scene, you might be scratching your heads a bit as to who Jesus really was. I mean, there's no doubt that from the very beginning, there's all these signs pointing to Jesus as being someone really big, really significant, right? He performs miracles, he heals the sick, he casts out demons, he must be sent from God. But then there are others who aren't so sure. Because Jesus doesn't fit into our mold, our traditions. He seems to contradict our religious leaders, claiming that these leaders, they've actually strayed away from God's intention. And we saw that last week. And there are all these hints all along, all these allusions and promises that, that are fulfilled from the Old Testament from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, all pointing to Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ, the, the, the King that God promised would save Israel and bring light to the world. But then again, Jesus himself never explicitly says that that's who he is. So who exactly is Jesus? Well, finally today, Jesus answers the question directly. First he asks, who do the people say I am, the Son of Man is? Let's start with the outsiders, those who aren't in Jesus' inner circle. And the response is varied. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets right? Again, the crowds know that Jesus must be someone special, but they don't seem to go far enough to say that he is the Messiah. So Jesus now asks, who do you think I am to his disciples, to those who know him really? And Peter is the first to speak up. You are the Messiah, the 
the son of the living God? Peter says, yes, you are the one. You are that promised king that we've been looking forward to, the son of David who would rescue God's people, the promised king whose reign would never end and would lead us, lead God's people into glory forever. And Peter goes further. He adds, you are the son of the living God. And this tells us that Peter understood that the Messiah, the Christ, was not simply a title, but seeing Jesus and his life, he's beginning to see that there's a deep intimacy that Jesus has with God the Father, and perhaps even more than a deep intimacy, but this we can't be sure yet. But Jesus affirms Peter. Yes, Peter. Yes, you got it. That's exactly who I am. Finally, what was teased so much over and over again over the last 15 chapters, what people had on the tip of their tongues but they couldn't articulate, it's finally unambiguous. It's explicit. It's confirmed by Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. But then Jesus makes this remark. Peter has gotten it. He is blessed not because of flesh and blood, not because of his own human wisdom or observational skills alone. Peter wasn't somehow more intelligent than others. But Peter is blessed because this truth was revealed to Peter, revealed by God himself. God is the one who opened Peter's eyes to this truth. Now, ever since I became a Christian, uh, something that I've always been interested in is apologetics, right? Uh, That is answering questions and objections that people might have about the the Bible, who Jesus was, the cross, uh, Christianity. Uh, Because my coming to faith, a big part of that was actually having my answers, uh, my questions answered. And I had to dig around and I had to be convinced that there were logical arguments to my questions about faith. And so I always wanted to go deeper, uh, reading more books, Uh, how I might rationally convince people of Jesus' existence, his miracles, his death and resurrection, and so on. And that's a good thing, right? Uh, We we do want to give informed, rational answers uh, to those who have questions. It's good for our own faith, even, to know that there is a logical integrity to what we believe in. But as I'm sure many of us would have experienced, uh, good logic alone can never open the eyes of someone to Jesus. That winning the argument, so to speak, no matter how persuasive, even if it's done by grace, can only serve to harden the other person sometimes, to make them even more defensive. And here we're told why. Seeing and believing who Jesus is, this is a gift from God. And so just as a side note, if this is true, that changes completely the way that we approach evangelism, doesn't it? Because if we think it's all up to our persuasive arguments that we just need to study more, watch more YouTube videos on apologetics, if we think all we need to do is to try harder without depending on God, without asking for God in His grace and mercy to to open hearts, we've gotten it all wrong, haven't we? No, no, it all depends on God to reveal the truth. So let's never forget that as we continue to diligently and graciously answer objections that people have, but let us never forget to ask God to be the one who is at work. But back to our passage today. Now that Peter has correctly identified who Jesus is, now what? Well, actually, it's Jesus' turn to now identify who Peter is. You are Peter. Now, remember, the apostle's name was Simon before he met Peter. And Jesus gives him the name Peter when they first met. Now Jesus will explain why he gave Peter the name. Peter means rock. And so Jesus uses a pun here. He says, on this rock, I will build my church. You are Peter. You are the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Uh, Just a reminder for for many of us, uh, the church isn't, of course, talking about the building, but it's the people of God. Jesus is, is referring to all of his people Across all time, across all geography, my church, my people, says Jesus, will be built on you, Peter. This can't be right, can it? 
the church must be built on Jesus, right? Not Peter. What, what's Jesus talking about? Now, the church that um, I, I was a part of growing up, the Roman Catholic Church, they would see this verse actually as proof of the teaching about the institution of the papacy. Uh, so that somehow uh, Peter apparently here is the first pope of the universal church. But let's just take a closer look at these verses and, and see what's actually going on here. What does, Peter, what does Jesus actually mean that Peter is the rock that the church will be built on? Well, actually, we need to look no further than the book of Acts. Who was the very first person to preach the gospel that Jesus is the Christ? Well, it was Peter at Pentecost. As soon as the, the Holy Spirit is poured out, people start speaking different languages, and amongst Jesus' followers, it's Peter who begins to explain what is happening. And he quotes the prophet Joel for telling that this is what's going to happen, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But more importantly, right after that, he preaches the gospel about Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. In particular, he quotes Psalm 16. Now, this psalm was well known to be about the Messiah, right? The Jews knew that. And what does it say? What does it say about the Messiah? That the one David pointed to, the son of David, the Christ the Messiah, was the one who would not be abandoned to the realm of the dead, the one who would not see decay. And so Peter's argument is this. Who else could the Messiah be apart from Jesus, right? It's not King David. King David died and decayed long ago. But it's the one who was crucified and raised on the third day. The realm of the dead could not contain Jesus. He did not see decay. See, the very first person to preach that Jesus was the Messiah was Peter at Pentecost. And as the first one, back to our passage today, as the first one who recognized Jesus' true identity, Jesus now gives Peter that responsibility to preach this very truth. And so can you see now how as the very first one to preach about Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, Peter becomes the first rock that is laid in Jesus' church. Now, no notice here, it's not saying that Peter is building the church, right? It is Jesus that's building the church. But Peter is the first stone that Jesus lays in the picture that he is painting today. Peter becomes that foundation of the church by modeling to other disciples and other followers of Jesus, the preaching of the gospel, which is how Jesus uses to build his church. But then you might ask, what about this whole section about the keys to the kingdom? What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven? It sounds a bit cryptic. Is it saying that Peter now has the sole right to approve entry into God's kingdom or, or deny access into God's kingdom? Well, again, we, we just have to consider what Jesus is saying here. What, what, what is the picture that Jesus is painting? That Peter's the foundation. The preaching of the Christ, the Messiah, is what Peter is doing that forms a foundation. Then that makes sense, doesn't it? Because how, how does one enter the kingdom of God? Isn't it through believing in the preaching that Jesus is the Christ? That Jesus is the one, the promised one, who paid for our sins and that we are accepted, we are clean because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And so how can someone believe that Jesus is the Christ unless they're told, unless someone is sent to preach this good news about Jesus? And so, of course, if Peter is the one who will be tasked with the very first preaching of this good news, can you see how, in a very direct way, he holds the keys to the kingdom? People can come into the kingdom if Peter preaches the gospel of good news. People are withheld entry into the kingdom if the gospel is not preached to them. And I think if we truly understand what Jesus is saying here, that should give us quite an uncomfortable challenge. Because in a very real sense, we also hold the keys to the kingdom, don't we? 
Because we have exactly the same gospel that was entrusted to Peter right here in this passage. I'll just drop it in for us to question, to question, for us to ponder. Have we been withholding the keys to the kingdom because of our reluctance or indifference to share the gospel? Something still worth asking ourselves. But again, back to our, our passage, there's a lot of side, side points today. Uh, I've skipped over an important promise that Jesus actually gives us here. As Jesus builds his church, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, if you were a Jew back then, the word, the term Hades would have caught your attention to those who are looking out for the Messiah. Because we've actually come across this term in another form today already. Because Hades is simply the Greek translation or Greek equivalent to the word Sheol, which we came across in Psalm 16 that Peter preached on. And so let's see what the connection is. Jesus is saying, just as I won't be abandoned to the realm of the dead, that is Sheol, or the Greek translation Hades, so also my church will not be overcome by the gates of Hades, by the realm of the dead. Just as Jesus has overcome the grave, he won't be contained by death, so also I now give that promise to my church. My church, my people will experience in my victory over the realm of the dead as well. And so finally, this is it. That's what God's people were waiting for, that king to lead us into God's everlasting kingdom, the kingdom that will never end. Now God's people will never have to be oppressed again, right? And it looks like Peter understood it this way as well, but as we read on, it's clear that this picture is actually not complete. Because as Jesus explains the way ahead for him now, now that it's clear that he's the Messiah, Peter is in for a rude shock. Because as Jesus explains, that he now must go to Jerusalem to suffer, to be killed, and then be raised to life, Peter can't believe his ears. He ignores the last part of what Jesus said, and he's just focusing on the suffering and the, and the being killed part. Jesus, you've just told us that you're the Christ, the one who would never see, de- see decay. You promised that your church, your followers, would never be overcome by the gates of Hades. It just doesn't compute. How can God's everlasting king come close to suffering or being killed? You can understand Peter's shock here, right? Jesus' response to Peter's words are just as shocking because Peter went from finally seeing Jesus as the Christ, the first one to do so, the first one bold enough to say so. He's been given this huge responsibility of being the rock to build Jesus' church to now he's being called Satan. Doesn't that sound a bit extreme? Why does Jesus go so far as to call Peter Satan, after he got so much right. Well, let's, again, take us back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. As Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, we saw that even though he was perfect, he was sinless, he was the Son of God, and yet what Jesus does first is to be baptized, to identify as one of us, as sinful humanity, needing to be washed by the waters of baptism. That's what he chooses to do. And then what happens? Immediately after his baptism, we see Jesus being led into the desert to be tempted by Satan himself. And how did Satan tempt Jesus? He offers Jesus a shortcut to glory. Don't take God's road. Don't trust God to protect you. Don't wait for God's timing, have to go through suffering and death. Look, just listen to me, Jesus. I'll give it to you. Just bow down to me. You can seize power for yourself, seize glory for yourself. You don't have to be hungry anymore. You can rule the world right now. And isn't that in a nutshell what humans are concerned with? It's just about getting to a desired outcome, the quickest way possible, sometimes regardless of how we get there. The ends justify the means. And the human concern in an effort to get to our humanly desirable outcomes, well, so often we miss the far more important aspects of what actually God is concerned about. Because what have we seen in God's kingdom so far? 
What's God's concern? Uh, Just as last week, uh, Pastor Iggy showed us how Jesus cares not just for the, the superficial, the physical, the outward religious cleanness, that we, we try to show by, by, by doing things. God cares about our hearts, our hearts which are not clean, and we so desperately need Jesus to deal with that uncleanness. We care about physical oppression, physical sickness, physical poverty, whereas God cares about spiritual oppression, slavery to sin, spiritual poverty. And so you think the Messiah is going to be fantastic because he's going to to save you from the Roman Empire? Even if he does so, what's the point? Even if Jesus kicks out Caesar and all the Romans, what's the point if you are still enslaved to the very thing that separates you from God and his kingdom? And so Peter needs to have in mind the concerns of God, not merely the concerns of man. And so while it's so easy, it's natural even for us to to sympathize with Peter, to say, no, Jesus, I love you. You are my Lord, my Messiah. I don't want you to go and die and suffer. You must not die. But the thing is, to tell Jesus to not die on the cross is to attempt to divert Jesus from his very purpose, his mission to save sinners. By attempting to, to get Jesus to forgo suffering on the cross, that is exactly what Satan wants so that God's people would be firmly within Satan's grasp. No, the the sins of the world left unatoned for. No way for sinners to be accepted by God as they continue to walk in darkness. No, this was the Messiah's ultimate mission and goal. To suffer and die in our place so that the fate that we deserved, he could take. And so that we might never be overcome by the gates of Hades. And the thing is, if this is the king of the kingdom, then this has implications for those of us who follow the king. Because Jesus now says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. If Jesus' path to glory is one of self-sacrifice, then those who would follow Jesus likewise need to deny themselves. No longer living for our own pleasure, to build our own reputation, to accumulate riches for ourselves. But not only just to deny ourselves, right? Jesus goes all the way. He says his followers must take up their cross. Now, this verse is one of those many verses that we've become so familiar with that it's easy to miss the impact of what Jesus is saying here. Let's think about what the disciples would have thought when they heard this. Taking up your cross meant that you were slowly, painfully dragging yourself to your own execution. Only the worst of the worst criminals would be sentenced to having nails driven through your hands and the feet left to slowly suffocate in agony, gasping for breath as they hung there naked for all to see. Taking up your cross meant dragging that heavy hunk of wood all the way from the city to the place where you would suffer and die the most horrific and shameful death. That's the image that Jesus has in mind here. And this is the image that Jesus has in in, in mind as to what his disciples following him would be like. For those of us here who follow Jesus, is this something that we've forgotten about when it comes to the Christian life? Is this the attitude that we take in when we come to our decisions in our life? But does it sound too much for you? When you hear those words, to take up your cross and follow Jesus, Does it make you want to recoil, to immediately want to make excuses or or, or to somehow soften the blow of what Jesus is saying? Surely, Jesus doesn't really mean we are to literally die, right? Surely, I don't have to give up all of my life. Can I I just give most of my life to Jesus? I'll I'll just keep a small amount. If not 49%, maybe how about 20%? I'll, I'll keep 20%. Jesus can have 80%. Maybe that's enough. Let's stop and hear what Jesus is saying to us who want to follow him. 
take up your cross and follow me. All of your life, prepare to die for Jesus. Now, there are some of us here who would take this verse and use it as justification to somehow burn ourselves out as we sacrifice our health, our family relationships in order to do as much ministry as possible, not thinking about the long term. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what Jesus is trying to say here. And it's not also that we try to attract as much attention, as, as much persecution as possible as, as, as some in history have interpreted these verses looking for a way to, to die as quickly as possible for, for Jesus on purpose as to somehow attain more glory for themselves. But if we get what Jesus is saying here, then it does mean that our lives have changed directions completely. Not, not just shifting our motivations or, or goals, you know, five, ten degrees. I'm just going to point it this way now, sort of slightly pointing towards Jesus. But we've moved completely 180 degrees. We've done a U-turn, no longer living for ourselves, but completely living for God. It's the difference between asking, am I allowed to do this for myself? Can I I spend this on myself? Versus asking, how can I use all that I have to serve Jesus best? All that we do, our work, our rest, our play, That will all be done to honor Jesus. And yes, even to the extent of facing death for his sake, if need be. Let's be clear here. These are not meant to be trivial and light words. Jesus is in no uncertain terms asking for our lives. But there's a very good reason Jesus is offering this to us or asking this of us. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And here again, we start to see the upside down nature of God's kingdom. To save your life, you need to lose it, but if you lose your life for Jesus, you'll find it. But as we've already seen, there is often a human perspective on seeing things that completely misses God's perspective on seeing things. And this is the case again. Because Jesus wants us to see the reality of what true living is. That what we currently hold on to as the life that we cherish, the life that we're living now, that that pales into insignificance when compared to what God says is true life. Because let's remember what Jesus has just promised Peter. The realm of the dead, Hades, Sheol, will not overcome his church, his people. Surely, just as Jesus' death will not have the final word in Jesus' story, just as Jesus defeats death, so also will Jesus' followers not have physical death as the final chapter of their story. The life that you gain when you trade in your old, that's the new life you get when you enter into God's kingdom, that's true living. And so how, that, how can that even compare to this life? How that, can that even compare to the world? Right? Any pleasure, riches, status that you can ever get in this life, it won't even last. It'll just be a brief blip in the scheme of things. Any pleasure, riches, status that you can have in this life, it's only but a shadow of what God has in store for us in God's kingdom living under him as we were meant to. And so as as Jesus makes the most extreme comparison, what if we gain the whole world? Let's just play along with Jesus here, right? Let's just spend a moment to imagine that very thing, right? The whole world. I mean, sometimes it's hard for me to even imagine winning lotto. Like, I'll have so much money that I don't even know what to do with it. Just give me a couple of million. That's enough for me to spend for the rest of my life. But no, let's push it to the extreme. You own the whole world. Uh, Jeff Bezos, apparently the richest man on earth at the moment, has about 200 billion US net worth. That sounds like a lot. Uh, But if you literally own the whole world and its net worth, you would apparently now have uh, $431 trillion at your disposable US. Right? Jeff's net worth is only 0.05% of what you now own. And so flying into space on a weekend luxury trip, that's less than spare change to you now. The whole world is yours. 
You can do whatever you want. Go wherever you want because it's all yours. I'll just give you a moment to just let your mind drift to what you would do if you had the whole world. And now stop and ask yourselves this. Even if all that you just dreamt of came true, then what? After you've gotten all that you could ever dream of, how long would you be able to hold on to that before a couple of years' time, maybe a decade's time, sickness sets in? And you won't even be able to enjoy all that you possess. You won't even even be able to leave your bedroom. How long before that all that you have, the whole world in fact, would inevitably pass on to someone else as your last breath leaves your body, as you're buried in the ground or, or cremated and put in a jar somewhere. So what if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? All right. What if for a brief moment, in the blink of an eye, you own all there is to own, but you spend the rest of the age to come on the outside looking in. Looking in at what true abundance, true joy, true blessing is that you've missed out on for all eternity. The blessing that makes you wonder why you even cared about a mere $400 trillion. What is that? That's nothing. We know that, right? We know that. But so often we forget that. So often we just want to keep clutching onto the things of this world, not wanting to let go. But if we truly see what Jesus is offering us, then why would we want to hold on? Why wouldn't we gladly trade in our current state of existence for the sake of Christ in order to attain true life? And this actually reminds me of a story I heard from a pastor in Sydney a few years ago. I don't know, some of you might know a pastor called Pastor Eugene Hall. Uh, but I heard him speak a couple of years ago, speaking about a young woman in his church who had decided to quit her job as a lawyer, a high-paying job, lots of career progress, so that she could instead go to Bible college and head to Japan as a missionary to share the good news about Jesus. And as Pastor Eugene was uh, talking to all the friends and family of this young woman, something that he kept hearing was that they pitied her it's such a shame that she's leaving behind such a good career, that she's, she works so hard to, to get into uni for, to, to work so hard to study for and, and, and find this job and, and work her way up to where she is now. What a shame. Oh, I, I can see why she wants to be a missionary, but it's just so sad that she's leaving so much behind. She would have had so much if she stayed instead of going. See, I wonder if deep down we might have similar thoughts like that. If maybe a close friend who decided to give up their jobs to go to a dangerous country, a closed country to share about the gospel, would we secretly pity them for what they would have missed out on? For for those of us who are now parents, I wonder if we secretly hope that our kids won't make that decision to go to a really dangerous country for God, for, for Christ's sake. But, if, but it's Eugene's comments after this story that I keep remembering, remembering even to this day because he, he challenges all of us. He says, why are you pitying her? Can't you see she's trading up? No matter how you look at her situation, she is not losing out one bit leaving her career to go to Japan to share about Jesus. And that's something we all need to remind ourselves, right? As we keep making decisions in our lives, we need to realize that there is nothing that we can ever give up. Even if it's our lives, there is nothing that we can give up that won't ultimately be the best trade we ever make if we gain our souls, if we gain entry into God's kingdom. And so let's just consider that calculation, all right? Hear again Jesus' words to his disciples and to us today. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Again, this is a very serious and heavy thing that Jesus is asking for. But my hope and prayer is that you'll see that 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 trade is worth it. 
it's so worth it. This path pathetic, weak self that, that, that's going to decay sooner or later. That's what Jesus is getting us to lay down. This temporary life trading in for the perfect life under God for all eternity. And as we consider that trade, let's just remember, let's just remind ourselves who is calling us to lay down our lives, right? It's Jesus. It's the Christ whom the grave could not contain. It's Jesus who has promised that his, ch that his church will not be overcome by the gates of Hades. And if you follow Jesus, that's you. You belong to Jesus. You belong to the Messiah. You belong to the one who has overcome the grave. And so too will you overcome the grave if you follow Jesus. And so let us take up our cross now and continue to give our lives to Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we battle our insecurities in our lives, as the things of this world keep threatening what we want to hold on to and, and grasp on to uh, for our pleasure, for our status, for our ultimate goal and happiness, Lord, we thank you that you are the one that secures eternal life, the life of the age to come, perfect relationship forever under you as king. We thank you that you offer this life. And all we have to do is to trade in our small, pathetic, temporary lives to get that. Father, will you help us through the Spirit to see just what a no-brainer that is for all of us to keep willingly and joyfully Give our lives to keep serving you so that we can win our souls because of what you have done to pay for our sins on the cross. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.